everyone out there this is roar with another update it's been seven days since my third chemo session but before i begin i just wanted to say a big thank you to all those who have supported via the gofundme if you haven't donated uh, we would really appreciate it if not if you're not in, the, in that position that you can please go ahead and share on your uh, social media that would help out a ton as we continue to try to reach our goal we are 60 percent of the way there uh currently this third chemo session hit me harder than we expected. I'm not sure if it was the shorter duration between my second and third chemo session or just the fact that the poison continues to add up in my body. Overall, the symptoms that I've experienced so far, uh, fatigue, nausea, and the neuropathy in my fingers continues to um, be a factor. Um, burning kind of in my chest, my hair loss obviously, my, my beard fell out. I went out to dinner the other night, dinner and a movie, and when I came back, half of my beard was essentially on the upper part of my shirt. I was wearing a light color shirt, um, and so I was like, okay, I need to shave the beard at this point. Uh, as my hair continues to grow back in, uh, it's definitely not growing in as thick, and it's growing much lower as, as it come, continues to come back in. I haven't shaved in about five days where normally I'd be showing a pretty good um, uh, shadow right now on my face. Beyond that, I found myself more easily agitated this week, so I'm trying to concentrate on controlling my own personal emotions and uh, not overreacting with the kids, and then just generally feeling bad uh, across across my body. The good thing though is just knowing that it wouldn't last forever. Uh, like I said, this is a week after and I'm starting to feel more like a human today. As far as workouts, I was able to work out on the day of my chemo. I did a light run and workout before my chemo session. I did a workout the next day as well. I uh, did some cardio and then some uh, strength training workouts. Days three, four, and five after my third chemo session though, I was beat. I was just happy to get out of bed, try to accomplish a little bit, help out with the family, but overall, uh, no workouts were done there. They did day six, I was able to work out, and then today, I was also able to work out and get to the gym, uh, get some uh, strength training done there. The problem today is that I bursted uh, some of the veins in my arm. Uh, when working out, I was doing some curls. My veins were um, popping out as they normally do when you're working out. Uh, and I looked down at, in between sets and my right arm started to swell up a little bit. I went to the doctor and he called it superficial thrombophlebosis, uh, which is essentially in between two valves in my arm that the, the, art, the vein bursted. Uh, and so that's why they're swelling. He recommended that I put a heart cock compress on it every um, two hours for about 10 minutes and hopefully in the next two weeks it'll heal up and I'll be able to work out again but for the next two weeks I'll stick to lower body workouts or uh, or cardio for the most most part just to try to give my arm my veins in my armor break that's most likely due to either the chemo drugs making my veins a little bit more brittle or just me still recovering from my heart surgery when most of my uh, veins stopped working with the IVs uh, and I bursted a few veins then as well as far as the port limitation I'm not sure if I've, I've updated in the videos or not um, but some people have asked me my port itself uh, right here as you can see, that was stitched into four different places in my pec, so it's really not, not a factor when I work out. So before my veins started bursting today, um, I was able to work out no problem, no limitations really at all. I just didn't want to lay on it because it definitely applies some pressure and it hurts a little bit if you lay directly on your port. So overall, my DFP for today, uh, my diet focus point, if you will, for uh, these videos. I've had a lot of people ask me about cancer diets. Some cancer patients have reached out as well as uh, just some friends saying, hey, dude, what have you been told as far as diets? What should you eat? What should you avoid? And it's too much really to encapsulate into one video to talk about a general diet. Realize that these diet lesson learns are from a fighter pilot uh, who, you know, I have a master's degree, but really not in anything that has to do with nutrition. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a doctor. Uh, however, uh, I did go to a dietitian this past week and I was thoroughly unimpressed uh, with, with the whole act uh, that I met there. I had a list of about 30 questions I was going to ask her uh, that I did ask her. I was not able to achieve an answer that I really uh, liked for most of the questions. My mentality overall when it comes to diet-based changes is I'm, I'm evidence-based, so I prefer to see studies uh, that show me that that uh, X equals Y, as opposed to a friend saying, oh, my mother's sister's cousin, she was cured from cancer by eating two tablespoons of coconut oil every day. That's great, I mean, uh, it's good for her, really, uh, and bodies do amazing things, but I'd like to see a study that, to show me that uh, if I'm gonna consume that much coconut oil, that uh, it actually proves that it works. All right, let's talk about fats for today for my DFP. I didn't know much about them beforehand, so now I'm gonna nerd out just for a second as far as the molecules, and we'll talk about actual practical purposes when it comes to fats. So there are two main categories of fats um, when we're referring to them. They're saturated and unsaturated. As you can see, the saturated fat uh, is saturated with hydrogen atoms. Beyond that, there are unsaturated fats. Under the category of unsaturated, Unsaturated fats, there are monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, and that just refers to the number of double bonds inside that atom. As far as trans fats, trans fats are a polyunsaturated fat that have been chemically changed so that they are no longer really liquid at room temperature. Uh, it changes the structure from a cis atom to a trans um, molecule, and at that point, they then become a uh, trans fat. Under the polyunsaturated fats, there's also things uh, that refer to as the omega-3, 6, or 9 uh, fats uh, that you might hear about a, a lot. All that refers to as far as the omega-3, 6, or 9, that's just 
the double bond where it occurs, if the double, double bond occurs third from the end, sixth from the end, or ninth from the end uh, out there. So that's kind of the, the nerded out, just chemical compound uh, of what the different fats look like. As far as saturated fats themselves, they were really demonized in the 1950s and 1960s based on some kind of false studies that correlated saturated fats to heart disease, and that really kicked off a huge non-fat or low-fat diet in America. Those studies have really thoroughly been debunked. Recently, there was a study that had 350,000 uh, participants and another one that had over 600,000 participants that have proved essentially that saturated fats are really neither good nor bad for uh, your risk for heart disease uh, and or your, your diet when consumed at normal levels. As far as saturated fats themselves, where do you find them? That's generally the things that are solid at room temperature and that come from nature. So things like butter, um, that's going to be a, a saturated fat for you. As far as unsaturated fats, those are generally liquid at room temperature when they're coming from nature, besides the trans fat, which is a chemical, which has been chemically changed to uh, be solid at room temperature that we talked about based on that chemical structure. The big one I'll just hit now before I get into like really the meat of what I want to talk about is trans fats. Trans fats have been proven at this point basically to be terrible for you. Um, they've been banned in a lot of countries. In the U.S., they are going to be banned, I think, by the end of this year, um, which is going to start to change the, kind of some of the taste in, in the foods that we eat because sat our trans fats have really been incorporated to a huge portion of American's diet, uh, both in the fast food industry as well as in the processed food industry as well overall. It's been found that if you have a 2% increase in your trans fat, uh, you have a 23% increase in your likelihood of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. You might hear trans fats be re referred to as partially hydrogenated fats or hydrogenated fats. It's all the same thing. Trans fat just refers to the chemical makeup where partially hydrogenated refers to the way in which it was made, but essentially referring to uh, the same thing when it comes to trans fats. So the big thing, big takeaway for trans fats is you really want to avoid them. There's really no health ben health benefits for them. Uh, they might take, make your food taste a little bit better. However, uh, they're just terrible for you. That's why they're going to slow. They have been banned in a lot of countries and they will be banned, I think, by the end of this year in America. How do you know if you're avoiding them? You can just check the dietary label, look for trans fats, and I want to also check the ingredients on the list. If anything says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, uh, most likely that's a trans fat uh, in there. It doesn't need to be listed under trans fats on the top nutritional portion if it has a certain percentage. So, nonetheless, I would check the ingredients uh, to avoid those. All right, so the big discussion that I want to talk about today was uh, omega 6 and omega 3 fatty acids. So, realize omega 6 and omega three are considered essential uh, acids for us because our bodies can't produce them. Uh, omega nines, our bodies can produce them, so I'm really, not really going to discuss um, omega nines all that much. These fats aren't just used for energy in our body; uh, they're used for uh, a plethora of things, like uh, they help with blood clotting, they help with uh, inflammation, as well as uh, other things. As far as specifically, what does each help with? Omega six increases your inflammation in your body, so that's useful when you're injured or, or your body's trying to fight something. Uh, but it also increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and increases your risk of violence, as well as depression uh, and some other negative effects, effects um, of omega sixes uh, in some studies that I've seen. Omega-3s decrease your inflammation levels, um, which is good when you're not fighting anything. You want to have lower inflammation within, inside your body. It decreases your risk of heart disease. It helps you fight depression, as well as schizophrenia, and has a, a few other health, health benefits as well that have been uh, proven through these various studies. So the big thing is really the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio inside of our body. Currently, as far as um, Americans, we have either a 16 to 1 to up to a 50 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio inside of our bodies. Most scientists, they, they kind of vary, but anywhere from a 4 to 1 down to a 1 to 1 ratio is what they, they say we should have. So omega-6 have skyrocketed in America. There's been a 200% increase in omega-6 consumption uh, in America over the past 50 years. And that's really due to what we talked about in the very beginning when saturated fats were, were viewed as harmful. They were all of a sudden sw switched and trans fats were taking over for saturated fats. And a lot of those trans fats caused... Uh, um, this, this spike. So where do we get most of these are from seed and vegetable oils, uh, specifically like soybean and other vegetable oils uh, that we are, are very common in processed foods uh, that you'll see out there. Soybean is the largest source of omega-6 in uh, the, the American diet right now. I think it accounts for 20 or 25 percent of the omega-6 in our diet. The reason we use it is because it's cheap, right? And it can be incorporated into all sorts of foods and it increases shelf life and does all sorts of uh, wonderful things for the marketers, but terrible things really for the consumer. So what this omega-6 um, fatty acid does, it's, it's very reactive uh, inside the body. So that's one of the reasons that causes cardiovascular disease, but it's also been linked to different cancers as well. So because these double bonds are so reactive, they'll react with oxygen inside the body and then they'll, they'll form these things called free radicals. What these free radicals can do, these free radicals can damage your different cells inside your body and specifically the DNA inside your body. The result of these free radicals is really aging and uh, potentially causing cancer. It's been linked to, in multiple studies to the various types of cancer out there. So omega-6 generally is just not, not good for you, but you do need it. It is one of those essential acids uh, for that inflammation. 
is the big uh, takeaway that omega-6 provides for us. So how do we avoid omega-6 in our diet? Uh, some things you want to avoid is that uh, anything, most things that have say soy in them, for the most part, are going to have be high in omega-6, uh, as well as vegetable oils. I'll show you a chart uh, that shows the difference between omega-6 versus omega-3 and the different fatty acids. I think it's pretty uh, pretty clear to see, but big takeaways there. Uh, specifically, you want to avoid sunflower oil, uh, corn oil, soybean oil, and cottonseed oil. Those are some of the big ones that you want to avoid uh, that are high in uh, omega-6. Best oils to take away are going to be coconut oil, uh, olive oil, and butter. A common response to coconut oil is that it's high in saturated fats which we've talked about, where it's not really as much of a factor as we thought, as well as the type of saturated fat that coconut oil has. It's a medium chain fatty acid. So your body di digests it just a little bit different and actually goes directly to your liver and gets converted into ketones, a different form of energy for your body. Uh, so not as uh, much of a factor as, as people like to like to claim there. Other thing you want to avoid to avoid omega-6 is going to be processed foods. Again, check those labels and you'll see if it has like soybean oil or uh, anything, uh, any of these vegetable oils in it, most likely you're going to be high in um, omega-6 uh, fatty acids there. Some people may tell you that nuts are high in omega-6, uh, which they are, but they're nutrient dense and uh, they're well worth the consumption of the omega-6. If anything, I would just prefer to get my omega-6 consumption uh, through uh, my daily intake of, of nuts, so to speak. All right. Uh, Grass-fed versus grain-fed grain beef. So animals that are fed with a uh, grain diet, generally in, involving corn and uh, soy, uh, those ones are going to be higher in omega-6 as well. Uh, however, it's it's that's still up for debate as far as the uh, the studies that I've seen the amount of omega six you get in it. Nonetheless, I think eating grass fed beef uh, is generally just going to be slightly more nutritious for you um, for the overall consumption there. The big difference really is when it, when I've seen in the studies is going to be the eggs. So uh, eggs you want to avoid the uh, the grain fed uh, chickens uh, if you can. You want to take the uh, the pasture chickens are going to be the best. The chickens that can go out in the field and actually eat uh, you know the grubs and the worms and things like that. Uh, they're going to have a much higher omega three content in their eggs and much lower omega-6 content. They're also more nutritionally dense uh, as far as an egg. You may see some omega-3 enhanced eggs. I would prefer those over the, the grain-fed eggs. Um, but nonetheless, if I need to eat an egg for health, I'll just eat whatever one I can. By far, your best way to consume omega-3s and good omega-3s for you is going to be uh, through fish. Uh, it's recommended you eat one to two uh, fatty fishes a week. Uh, things like mackerel, salmon, and trout are all great fishes to, to get your omega-3 intake uh, for, for your week. Prefer wild caught based on uh, other nutritional facts and avoiding the dyes and stuff that are in the farm-fed fish, but nonetheless, again, I'd rather you get your omega-3s uh, from fish uh, rather than just increasing your omega-6s uh, in general eating as processed foods. If you can't eat fish, or you're not in an area, or you're not able to eat fish for whatever reason, or you don't like it, uh, I would just supplement with fish oils. Uh, find a good fish oil. There's a, a, all sorts out there. Some people recommend cod or other oils as long as it's, uh, I would just check the label. Really so omega-3 is it breaks down into different categories as well. There's DHA, there's EPA, and there's ALA. Uh, the DHA and EPA are really what uh, helps support our brain uh, and heart function as well as a, a bunch of other organs in our body. So that's really what we want to get out of our omega-3s. The ALA, our body can take, but we really can't convert into that EPA or DHA nearly as well. And that's uh, where we get from non-organic uh, sources. So like flax and chia, a lot of people will say, hey, I'm getting my omega-3 through those, but really your body's not digesting them as well uh, or really not converting them as well as you uh, thought they might've been uh, from that ALA omega-3 to that to EPA or DHA. All right, so overall, I've kind of nerded out on fats. Hopefully you helped yourself out or maybe you learned something, a thing or two. Big takeaways for me from this week for my DFPs, I'm gonna be avoiding a lot of the processed foods. And if I am eating processed foods, which I will inevitably, uh, I'm just checking, checking the labels. I'm avoiding the vegetable oils, the soybean oil, if I can. Anything that shows trans fat in the nutrition uh, guide, I'm definitely going to avoid that as well. Trying to increase my uh, consumption of fish. Uh, Flaxseed and chia seeds are still good for you and still good. I have uh, plenty of other uh, nutrients. However, just realize they're not going to be a single source of omega-3s, especially those um, those pivotal essential omega-3s that you need. And really the big takeaway is that ratio, right? Just understanding the ratio of your omega-6 versus your omega-3 really probably needs to be decreased as an American. Maybe most of you are super healthy and healthier than uh, I am. Uh, well, most of you probably are healthier than I am right now, but uh, just realize that I think that ratio is the, is, is the big takeaway. Again, I'll try to list as many as I can the, the different studies and websites and um, and sources that I found for, for a lot of this information. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm an evidence-based type of guy. I try to go straight to the studies or the people who have analyzed the studies and I'll take uh, their, their word for it. That's all I have for this week. I'm sorry for the extended video, but I hope you got something out of it. I uh, appreciate all the support you guys and I love you and I'll talk to you later. See ya.